Hey everybody, thank you for watching Leaf by Leaf. Today I'm going to do my first video of Robert Musil's The Man Without Qualities. As I stated in my uh, video about my uh, 2020 mandatory reading, The Man Without Qualities was one of them and I mused on doing it in January and I'm doing just that. Um, this is going to be a three-part uh, mini-series, if you will, uh, where this video right now covers um, the first volume of the two-volume set from Knopf. And it, uh, it is comprised of a sort of introduction and pseudo-reality prevails. So this is on those first two. Um, the next video will be on Into the Millennium, which is the third part of the uh, published version of The Man Without Qualities. And then the third video will be all the posthumously published material. So this video today covers about 725 pages of the novel. The second vid uh, video will cover about 500, uh, uh, sorry, yeah, 500. And then uh, the third video will cover the last 500 of unpublished uh, material. The cool thing about uh, reading Musil's uh, book here in January of 2020 is that uh, a, per a person from um, from a mass reading group, um, mostly on Twitter under the hashtag Moozle2020 and hashtag The Man Without Qualities or hashtag um, TMWQ. Her handle is Paper Pills, which I quite like. Uh, she sought me out on Goodreads when she saw that I posted I was currently reading this and she pulled me into Twitter. Twitter is um, a part of the internet cosmos um, in which I have not spent a lot of time. I use it basically just to uh, put notifications out there that I've published videos. Um, but nonetheless, I'm, I'm finding quite um, an elite uh, and knowledgeable group of people out there um, who have reached out to me and whom I've connected with. And so thank you all so much for uh, being so warm and inviting. Um, and lots of uh, subscribers and commenters and connecting now on Instagram and so on. So um, it's really great to find a community, especially um, in, in serious reading, because serious reading uh, involves a lot of solitude, a lot of isolation in order to read these books. The Man Without Qualities is certainly not something I can, you know, take to the beach or, or take to sit and read while my daughter is doing gymnastics because the least amount of noise will completely throw me off and cause me to have to restart uh, probably a whole chapter. Um, <clears throat> so it's really nice to connect with people um, and I've found that it's uh, very invigorating. If you're thinking about reading the book, um, go ahead and do it. If you're like me, these volumes have been sitting on your shelves for upwards of uh, three or four years, beg begging for you to read them, but you've been intimidated and daunted um, by it. I can tell you that uh, it's actually a very uh, inviting reading experience. Um, and now with the people that can be around you for um, hashtag Moosel 2020, um, you can get even more support and accountability. Virginia Woolf once said about Proust after reading A la recherche d'un perdu, um, what, what's left to do now for the novelist? Um, and really the same thing can be said for The Man Without Qualities. Uh, I found that by the end of this uh, first volume, I'm, I'm stunned at the ground he manages to cover. Um, and I find myself uh, thinking, what, what more can be said? I'm going to take a quote uh, towards the end of this volume uh, to just go ahead and give a disclaimer on this video. In, in such a massive cosmos of a book, in, in, in Musil's world, um, one really has to be completely immersed in the whole context, uh, context of it all um, for these excerpts or quotations and so on that I'm going to use. Um, and so it's, it's like, um, you know, detaching these from the book in context are going to diminish the value a little bit. Nonetheless, I hope they're pointers 
uh, to the text, and it says there is no detaching an idea in a book from its context on the page. It catches our eye like the face of a person looming up in a crowd as it is being swept past us. So I guess what I'm saying is um, these are going to feel like uh, something that, you know, like that face looming in a crowd that's sweeping past you, and I hope that you'll decide to join the crowd. What is this book? Um, what genre is it? Well, um, it's a novel, it's a philosophical novel, a novel of ideas, a novel of possibilities, you could say, but it's also a novel against ideas and against possibilities. Like it says on page 384, ideas can never maintain themselves in the state in which they are most powerful. They're like the kind of substance that, exposed to the air, instantly changes into some other, more lasting, but corrupted form. There are really three strands to the uh, structure and content of this book. The first one is actually a very simple plot that centers around what's called the parallel campaign. I'll get into that more in a, mi in, in a minute. Uh, the second strand are all the philosophical digressions um, in, in a really cool Stanford uh, interview that I'll, I'll, I'll put the link to it in the description. Um, they talk about how uh, you know, really, um, you could pull out all these psychological digressions or these interpolated psychological treatises or essays um, and, you know, put them all together and just have them as a separate thing than the book itself. But really, um, they're not distractions or disruptions. All of it works together. They're, they're counterpoised to the narrative. And then the third strand um, is the rich amount of psychoanalysis that's going on between and of all of the characters. Um, in American literature, the only thing that really comes to mind is Henry James, of course, um, but it, it's, it's amazing. Um, we, we also have to consider that, you know, this is Austria and um, it's early in the 20th century, um, yet Musil's writing a little bit later, and so of course we are all thinking psychoanalysis, Austria, Sigmund Freud, um, was quite a presence um, in the uh, intellectual consciousness, so it shouldn't be any surprise um, the, the level of, um, of psychoanalytical inspection going on. Like I said, the plot is very simple. Um, Ulrich, who is the man without qualities, he gets connected uh, via his father to his cousin, Diatima, um, and, and there's this initiative um, of Austrian nationalists um, called the Parallel Campaign, um, and, and the whole deal with the Parallel Campaign is that they want to celebrate um, the impending anniversary of 70 years of reign um, of their emperor um, by basically doing something that showcases um, Austrian greatness. Now, at the same time, um, there's an impending 30-year anniversary of the Emperor of Germany, and there are a lot of uh, Germans and, you know, the Pan-German League and so on who, who see this parallel campaign in Austria as a jingoistic disruption uh, to the nations around them. Um, and they're standing up and, and saying, wait a minute, you know, this is, this is a slight uh, to Germans and so on. Um, and so there's all this opposition. Um, and right in the middle of all that is a, a Prussian named Arnheim, um, who is actually part of the parallel campaign. So there's this, these really tenuous um, uh, ethnic and nationalistic tensions. Uh, the simple plot is is that that is the backbone uh, of the whole thing, and then there are all these ideas and characters um, thrown into the mix of that. So what makes it complex is that on this backdrop of the parallel campaign, Musil not only has space to consider every topic under the sun, but to analyze sets of interpersonal relationships. And some of the most standout ones are um, Diatima and Arnheim. Uh, Diatima and Ulrich, Ulrich and Arnheim especially, Rachel and Ulrich, Gerda and Hans, Hans and Ulrich, Ulrich and Gerda, Walter and Clarissa, and Clarissa and Ulrich. The simple and the complex 
um, are constantly in this interplay, um, and especially even in the opening paragraph, which I won't read in its entirety, but um, it, puts, it, it puts the complex first and delays the simple for last. So the simple that it's all leading up to is, it was a fine day in August or the whole sentence, in a word that characterizes the facts fairly accurately, even if it is a bit old-fashioned, it was a fine day in August. And so what he's getting at is that being simple is old-fashioned. What's in vogue now is the complex, and that is a barometric low hung over the Atlantic. It moved eastward toward a high-pressure area over Russia, without as yet showing any inclination to bypass his, this high in a northerly direction. The isotherms and isotheres were functioning as they should and so on and so on. The setting, it takes place in 1913 in Austria. Of course, this is a year, uh, a very pivotal year leading up to the Great War. Um, it's a time of the dual mar monarchy where um, Austrian Empire and Hungarian Empire were equals. Um, and as Musel describes, or Ulrich decides, describes the mood at that time, I couldn't help noticing how prescient it is to our own times. There is a nameless mood abroad in the world today, a feeling in the blood of more than a few people, an expectation of worse things to come, a readiness to riot, a mistrust of everything one reveres. When it was written, um, it is a bit of uh, an ambiguous um, fact, and um, we don't really know when Musil started writing writing it, but we know that sort of the thinking and the process behind um, its conception began in the 1920s. Um, some of the chapters were published in 1931 and 1932. Um, he, he hadn't finished the book um, when he died in abject poverty um, in 1942. Um, and then the extant material was finally published in uh, the mid-1950s. So if you look on Goodreads, it's going to say 1930, I believe, uh, for the publication. And um, that, that's just because it kind of, uh, I think they're taking the, the median between 1920 and 1950 and, and saying that it was roughly 1930 novel um, in, in its historical context. It says, the inhabitants of this imperial and royal imperial Dash, royal dual monarchy had a serious problem. They were supposed to feel like imperial and royal Austro-Hungarian patriots, while at the same time being royal Hungarian or imperial royal Austrian patriots. Their understandable motto in the face of such complexities was, United We Stand, from Viribus Unitus, with forces joined. But the Austrians needed to take a far stronger stand than the Hungarians because the Hungarians were first and last simply Hungarians and were regarded only incidentally. By the way, this is spoken uh, by an Austrian. <clears throat> uh, regarded only by foreigners who did not know their language, as Austro-Hungarians too. The Austrians, however, were, to begin with and primarily, nothing at all. And yet they were supposed to be their leaders to feel Austro-Hungarian and be Austrian-Hungarians they didn't even have a proper word for it. Nor was there in Austria. Its two components, Hungary and Austria, made a match like a red, white, and green jacket and yellow and black trousers. The jacket was a jacket, but the trousers were the relic of an extinct black and yellow outfit that had been ripped apart in the year 1987. The trousers, or Austria, were since then officially referred to as the kingdoms and countries represented in the Imperial Council of the Realm meaning nothing at all, of course, because it was only a phrase concocted from various names. For even those kingdoms referred to, such holy Shakespearean kingdoms as uh, Laudemaria and Illyria, <clears throat> were long ago, were long gone, even when there was still a complete black and yellow outfit worn by actual soldiers. So if you asked an Austrian where he was from, of course he couldn't say, I am a man from one of those non-existent kingdoms and countries. So for that reason alone, he preferred to say, I am a Pole, a Czech, an Italian, Ladino, Slovene, Croate, Serb, Slovak, Ruthenian, or Wallachian. <clears throat> and this was his so-called nationalism. Imagine a squirrel that doesn't know whether it is a squirrel or a chipmunk, a creature with no concept of itself, and you will understand that in some circumstances, it could be thrown into fits of terror by catching sight of its own tail. 
So this was the way Cacanians related to each other, with the panic of limbs so united they stood that they hindered each other from being anything at all. Since the world began, no creature has as yet died of a language defect, and yet the Austrian and Hungarian, Austro-Hungarian dual monarchy can nevertheless be said to have perished from its inexpressibility. There's also a lot about greatness versus mediocrity. There are lots of interesting characters in here. Of course, Ul Ulrich is a standout for being uh, so enigmatic, um, but also Clarissa in her uh, obsession with Nietzsche and her uh, tearing apart from reality and her obsessing uh, over this um, this um, Ruth, this uh, brutal serial killer um, who is also a standout character, Moos Brugger. Um, he's a criminal being tried for uh, assaulting and killing prostitu a prostitute, probably more uh, than one. Uh, like I said, Clarissa is completely uh, obsessed with him, uh, perhaps because of that Nietzschean bent towards um, overcoming man. Uh, as we know in Crime and Punishment, Dostoevsky used this um, to, in a way, show that one of the ultimate things we could do to become the Superman would be to uh, surmount ourselves, and, and that culminated in killing a human being. Uh, Musburger and his trial are also uh, a way for um, considering what justice is, how to get justice in, in his case, uh, what is guilt, what, where, where is the line between sanity and insanity, um, intent, culpability, and so on. Um, I, of course, I've only read this, this first volume, um, but I believe that much more is going to come out of this, especially with the way uh, Clarissa acts out um, toward the end of this novel. It, it, it was really a great, great scene, um, and I think that Clarissa and Musebrugger are going to be, um, are going to ex expose some uh, profundities in, in the subsequent uh, sections. There's this really invigorating psychological sketch of Musebrugger. It's chapter 87 and it's called Musebrugger Dances. Um, now to connect him back to Clarissa and her obsession with Nietzsche, she's constantly talking about how Musebrugger is musical and needs to dance. Um, and I couldn't find it flipping through here, but I did note where she makes uh, uh, an allusion to Zarathustra uh, um, where Nietzsche says that we must have chaos within ourselves to give birth to a dancing star, or one must have chaos within oneself to give birth to a dancing star. And she's basically applying that to Musburger. She sees him as this, uh, with this internal chaos, with this external control, um, giving birth to a dancing star. <clears throat> and in this sketch, I won't read it, it's, it is just a few pages long. Um, oh, here it is. It says, the tangled mess smoothed itself out. A soundless dance replaced the intolerable buzzing with which the world so often tormented him. And this is, in my opinion, the uh, allusion to, to the dancing star. Um, but basically, despite being imprisoned, um, Musburger can feel that all the restrictions imposed upon him are actually coming from him. And furthermore, uh, psychologically, interestingly, um, this, these thoughts cause him to be hungry. Um, so, so there's this uh, sense of power that he gets that immediately makes him want to consume. Despite all of um, its erudition, it is not a dry novel by any means, and, and Musil is just as much a novelist as he is a philosopher. Um, and I'll just give two examples of what I felt were representative of good novel writing. On 152, or 151 and 152, the piano was hammering glinting note heads into a wall of air. Although the origin of this process was entirely real, the walls of the room soon disappeared, and there arose in their place golden partitions of music. That mysterious space in which self and world Perception and feeling, inside and outside, plunge into one another in the most indefinable way, while the space itself consists entirely of sensation, certainty, precision, a whole hierarchy of, or 
of ordered detail of glory. On page 706, Ulrich decided to walk home. It was a fine night, though dark. The houses, tall and compact, formed that strange space, street, open at the top to darkness, wind, and clouds. The road was deserted as if the earlier unrest had left everything in a deep slumber. Whenever Ulrich did encounter a pedestrian, the sound of his footsteps had preceded him independently for a long time, like some weighty announcement. The night gave one a sense of impending events, as in a theater. One had a notion of oneself as a phenomenon in this world, something that appears bigger than it is, that produces an echo, and, when it passes lighted surfaces, surfaces is accompanied by its shadow like a huge, spastic clown, rising to full height and the next moment creeping humbly to heel. How happy one can be, he thought. That concludes my first video of The Man Without Qualities. This is one of three videos. Um, this covers the first volume, which I just read. I highly, highly recommend it. I do not feel exhausted. I do not feel bogged down, though I do feel full. Um, my head is spinning. I already know that this is a book worthy of rereading. Um, <clears throat> it's one of those kind of like the anatomy of melancholy uh, where you, you will want to revisit it over and over throughout your life because it's much larger than you and it affords a lot of space for you to continue uh, to grow.